Tonight, this is going to be, well, actually, uh, uh, when Alan was giving the description of the program and so forth for people that have never attended one of these before, well, I'm one of those. So uh, this is my first time. Uh, and so this format is, is something different, unique, and uh, uh, I guess I'm kind of curious to see how well this is going to, to work. And then the subject matter, uh, in the context of the, the title of the presentation, uh, it's rather open-ended and it's, uh, you know, on the surface, rather dangerous to get into this, this particular topic. We've gotten involved in work on dietary supplements kind of through the back door, and it came out of a drug discovery screening effort that we were doing via a large NIH contract, and we identified some active uh, components that ended up being found in some nutritional supplements that are on the market and so forth. But before I get into a, you know, kind of a brief synopsis of, of some of our work, I thought I would take a step back and define what we're talking about and so forth. So in the context of nutritional supplements, it's a pretty broad area. And so we have probiotics, we have vitamins, and then we have things that will be referred to differently, but I like the term nutraceutical, and so these are nutritional products that are intended to counter something in the context of are related to human health, um, and most are plant derived, and the work that we are engaged in are on some plant derived products. Um, now in the, the context of the program, our research program that we have, uh, it's coming out of the NIH, and this is out of a relatively new aspect of the NIH. It's called the uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicines. Uh, this is a program intended as an educational outlet. You get on the NIH website, onto the NCAM website, and get information on alternative medicines and so forth. But it also is an avenue for funding, and their primary mission in the context of the research programs that they fund is to encourage and move people into doing mechanism of action studies of common nutritional supplements and so forth. And trying to take a lot of the anecdotal information that's out there, applying science, and then hopefully moving back into the clinic and do true proof of principle. But it's also intended not only to be looking at efficacy of uh, potential uh, nutritional supplements and so forth, but also safety. And this is where the FDA comes into play. And roughly, I think it was about 2009, the FDA was really mandated to start to provide oversight on the production of nutraceuticals, <coughs> these nutritional supplements. In the years prior to that, large companies that produce these things, there was oversight, but now there's a mandate for oversight on any of these productions, and the types of things that the FDA has to insist upon are proper production practices. So if you've heard of good laboratory practice and then GMP, good manufacturing practice, in order to do that, you have to have chemical signatures in the context of your product that will be reproducible and you need to have identified molecular components that do X, Y, and Z that you can measure and so forth. And this is where there are problems in the context of a lot of the nutraceuticals. They're very crude products and they contain a lot of potentially active components. And there's differences in their bioavailability, what they might do to cells, what the readout might be, and so forth. And so there's a conservative effort now to start to work through this stuff, but I think one of the uh, take-home messages I would like to give is that there is an enormous amount to be done, and this is probably the smallest component of the NIH budget. Uh, they don't fund that many grants, uh, but this is one area that five years ago I wouldn't have thought was a, a real high priority area for investigation, but after the last couple of years of working in this area, it clearly is an area that a lot of attention needs to be given to. 
So I'm going to give you two lessons uh, prior to moving into the, uh, the plant products in the context of nutritional or dietary supplements that uh, have taught us something. It's taught us something to really take a step back and make sure that when we're looking at these things that we are truly going through in a reductionist type of uh, uh, pathway of looking at the active components and, and these things. So in the context of probiotics, we don't work on probiotics, um, but there is an enormous wealth of literature on the impact of the microbial flora on our intestinal tract, uh, on the development of our intestinal tract, on the development and the maintenance of our immune system. We have known this for years and years and years. And this came originally from work, some of it being done originally here at MSU, using chambers in which animals could be grown in an absolutely sterile environment, so there was no normal flora, and then you were able to go in and look at the impact of having a normal flora or not, and then adding back bugs. And we learned, not me specifically, but uh, taking the immunology classes uh, after that, that uh, information was gathered, that the normal flora, that microbial biota within our intestinal tract is critically important in, for an immunologist developing a properly controlled immune system. In order to have the control mechanisms to know when the immune system needs to be engaging to get rid of something, or not to be reacting to things like food antigens and so forth. So that normal flora, very important. Now we know that certain microbial strains that provide certain benefits um, can be added to our flora. And there are anecdotal, some direct studies, evidence that that can have beneficial effects on inflammatory effects in the gut and so forth. So all this is relatively well known, wealth of literature out there. But, and I thought we were pretty much on top of a lot of that. But the students in microbiology gave a journal club a couple weeks ago that point out, boy, don't we, we really don't know all of the key things that we need to in order to make really rational, well thought out decisions of what type of impact we really want to have on that normal flora within the gut. And so in this particular study that was published in the National Academy of Sciences a couple months ago, they went into animals using the exact same technology that the Department of Microbiology was using in the 60s, in which they grew animals under sterile conditions, so no bugs in the gut. And then they compared the induction of an autoimmune disease in these animals that is a mimic of MS in humans. And this is a neurological disease that will be induced and it's a waxing and waning. It'll trigger uh, a paralysis response that will disappear, much like the waxing and waning that you see in MS. It is induced by taking a protein from the nervous system and sensitizing the animal to that protein. And then the immune system of the animal will attack that protein within the myelin sheath within the nervous system, and you'll get this paralysis event. And like I said, it's transient. Well, as an immunologist, and as I understood the impact of the normal flora, I would have predicted that you would have seen more of this response in an animal that had a normal flora that had led to a developed immune system that you get a robust antigen response and then you get the disease. They got the exact opposite results. When they looked at the germ-free uh, animal, there was no induction of the autoimmune response. It would occur in the, the uh, wild-type animals, and when they added back the bacteria to the germ-free, boom, you got the autoimmune disease in that particular study. And so, what that is teaching us is that we still have a long ways to go of really understanding how that microbial flora can really impact peripheral events within the body. 
And so we do, now, we do have the technology, the sequencing technology, to start to go in and look at the diversity of that normal flora, look at the impacts of different microbes and their communication, the ecology, and so forth. And so, kind of a long-winded little story there, that taught me we still got a lot to learn on the probiotics side of the equation because we got the opposite of what I as an immunologist would have predicted in that setting. Now, uh, a second lesson. Well, and probably most of the people in this room are familiar with this one, and that's in the area of vitamins. And so, in the 60s and 70s, once we started to appreciate the importance of vitamins, um, people started taking vitamins. And in some instances, based upon, and I went to one of the lectures by Linus Pauling on vitamin C, in which he led off his talk by putting a goat up on a slide and saying, a goat is smarter than we are because of the amount of vitamin C they take in per day. And he had his arguments of anti-tumor cell activity, but also he had that story about cure for the common cold and, and so forth. And that led to people taking mega doses of vitamin C. That story is the same for vitamin E and a lot of other vitamins. But we now know those mega doses really don't have that much of a, a benefit. In fact, it's debatable now, and I'm not on one side of the fence or the other. It's another thing about my talk today. I'm not gonna tell you what, what is good, what is bad, and so forth. Just talk about the fact we need more science done. <laughs> but in the context of uh, uh, multivitamins, and this was news to me, there's an absolute divide within the experts of whether or not you really should be taking multivitamins every day. And when it really comes down to it, some of the best data now currently on vitamins is probably for vitamin D. We probably aren't taking enough vitamin D. But vitamin E, vitamin C, the B vitamins and so forth, those mega doses that I was taking for years and years, there really isn't the data to support that use. So we have another example that came from that. So now let's move into the plant-derived uh, nutraceuticals or dietary supplements and so forth. Um, I'm going to spend my time today talking about some of our work on polyphenols, plant-derived polyphenols. Um, and I doubt I'll have the time to, to go into some of our work on plant-derived polysaccharides and some of the work that we're doing. The story is roughly the same, um, and so I've got 25, 30 minutes. Uh, I gave a talk in microbiology about two months ago. And, I think I only got through the polyphenols in an hour to even get to the, uh, the poly, polysaccharides. But how we got involved in this wasn't because we had a primary interest in nutritional supplements. It was this drug discovery efforts that we were uh, undertaking about five, six years ago. And what we were trying to do was to identify materials, compounds, that could enhance the activity of a particular cell type of our immune system. So it's always dangerous to talk about immunology in a short period of time because uh, we've got a Randy student here that had to listen to me for a whole course and I told him in the four weeks I teach WAMI, I don't have enough time to, to cover immunology in appropriate detail. So it can be a little dangerous uh, to throw out a little bit of information. But what I'm going to focus on is that aspect of our immune system or our host defense that's preformed and really is involved in the initial response to infection. So that's referred to as our innate immune system. A particular cell type of the innate immune system that we've worked on now for about 20 years is called a gamma delta T cell. Okay? So this is a lymphocyte. It's a T cell and normally as an immunologist when you hear T cell you're not really thinking innate immunity, you're thinking adaptive immunity, and adaptive immunity is what makes us immune to a microorganism after we're exposed to it, or what makes us immune when we get a vaccine. Okay? That's adaptive immunity, that is controlled by the lymphocytes. We have T cells and B cells that perform distinct functions in that adaptive immune response. Within the T-cell pool population, there's two major subsets. One's called an alpha-beta, and 90% of immunology is based upon what alpha-beta T-cells do. But there's this oddball, this gamma-delta T-cell, 
And this happens to be probably the most ancient of the lymphocyte populations that arose through evolution. And this is a particular cell type lymphocyte, unlike a normal, I shouldn't say normal, the alpha beta T cell, when it's generated, and they're generated within the thymus, that's an organ that sits on top of our heart. Everybody in here, uh, we have a tough time finding your thymus now. It's most active when we're, we're kids. Uh, that's what we're generating most of our T cells. It'll generate both of these subsets. The alpha beta T cell goes to our lymph nodes and will circulate through the blood to our lymph nodes. And what they're looking for is something foreign that has found its way into the body. And then they're going to react to it. Because if it's foreign, got to get rid of it. It looks for it in a draining lymph node. So the draining lymph node serves as a concentration depot. Step on the rusty nail, all that garbage is delivered to the draining node behind the knee. Our lymphocytes go to that lymph node. It's almost a rule in immunology. The gamma delta T cell breaks that rule. When it exits the thymus, it doesn't like to go to lymph nodes. It goes to virtually all the portals of entry into the body. So it goes to epithelial tissues. So the epithelium lining our gut, the epithelium lining our lungs, inside our lungs, our tongue, our mouth. These cells are, as soon as they're generated, they're going to the site of entry into the body. And it's because of that location, we started to look at these cells as probably being more important in that initial response to infection because of their location. And we now know that's the case. These cells are in probably an important cell in our innate immune system. So in our drug discovery efforts, we wanted to identify materials that would allow us to control the activity of these cells. And then hopefully go back and see if whether or not we could have a beneficial effect on host defenses. Okay, so that's the basis of the drug discovery screen. We screen tens of thousands of synthetic compounds, but we also screened a lot of natural compound libraries. And we would see an interesting response with some of the crude extracts, uh, including some materials that people in the lab would just go downtown and buy. And the response of this, these cells, in response to these materials, was another thing that was somewhat unexpected. Again, here's the danger of talking about immunology, because now we're going to throw out the term cytokine to you. What a cytokine is, is a molecule made by cells of our immune system that performs some function that's important in how our host defense reacts against the pathogen. For gamma delta T cells in the old days, the signature cytokine was called gamma interferon. And so if you're going to look at the function of a gamma delta T cell, you look for gamma interferon. When we started to look at how these cells responded, though, in infections and so forth, we rarely saw gamma interferon. And we found another cytokine that's called GMCSF. What this particular cytokine is, is one that's very important in acting on our bone marrow to generate new cells, okay? New cells of, the, uh, of our leukocytes, our blood leukocytes, okay? So it's a growth factor. It's not this gamma interferon, which is a very potent inflammatory mediator. It really fires up our, our immune system. So we were finding this particular type of response in our gamma delta T cells in response to some of these extracts. We would get this GMCSF, not gamma interferon. And another response that we saw in these cells is that we made these cells respond better to second signals. So the first signal isn't really that robust. People don't jump up and down if you're an immunologist and you see GMCSF. You do if it's gamma interferon. But if we came in with the second signal on these cells after we treated them with the extracts, they responded better to the secondary signals. Okay? So we refer to this as an antigen. Antigen is something foreign. Antigen independent priming of our, our cells. And we have now moved on uh, with that particular response and started to characterize what are in some of these extracts. Okay? And so this got us involved in, in looking at polyphenols and polysaccharides derived from various plant sources. 
Uh, the polyphenols. Uh, for somebody who wasn't familiar with polyphenols at all, you go to the literature. This is not one you would choose to go into uh, and work. Uh, it's an incredibly complicated uh, series of plant molecules, and there's synthetic versions that could be generated as well. Um, there are many, many different chemical structures that are classified as polyphenols. Uh, and Drats here from the chemistry department could give you probably exquisite detail of the differences in many of these, these chemical structures. But the big take home message I want to give is there are thousands of defined chemical structures that we call polyphenols. And they have distinct differences. They have differences in the context of how large they are. They might be monomeric units, or they might be monomers brought together into dimers, trimers, and so forth. We could have some very complex or very simple structures. They also have some common features with phenolic rings and hydroxyl groups and so forth. But it's really striking the difference in the chemical structures. I'm going to come back to that in a few moments. So when you see the word polyphenol, don't think that this is a simple class of, of molecules. It's a very complex class of molecules. Now, there's differences in these polyphenols when you're looking at their impact on our cells. And everybody in here has heard about polyphenols and their antioxidant activity, right? That's touted as being one of the biggest benefits of polyphenols. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would guess everything that's classified as a polyphenol is probably an antioxidant. Maybe. I'm Close to it. At least so many a benefit. Of, uh, there's so many of them out there that I'm not sure, but a lot of them are. Yeah, just because of those reactive OH groups and, yeah. and so forth. And, and you, can, you know, there are multiple products in which they're touting the antioxidant activity and contributing it to Polyphenols. Polyphenols also have other activities that have been defined. They have been reported to have anti-tumor activity. We had an outstanding speaker uh, up at the museum about two months ago, Gary Stoner. I don't know if anybody in here, I know some of the people from Micro were obviously there, uh, had the opportunity to, to hear his work on a class of polyphenols from berries that have anti-tumor cell activity that he has really defined at the biochemical level that he's in the clinic with these uh, in cancer patients and so forth. Polyphenols also have some important benefit on weight loss. Uh, and another major activity of polyphenols that you will see in the literature if you go through it is rather robust anti-inflammatory activity. I mean, if you believe the literature, it's really robust anti-inflammatory. I mean, shutting things down. And one of the things that they shut down, supposedly, uh, is a very important transcription factor. And here's another dangerous thing to throw out there. But the transcription factor is something that controls gene expression. There's a transcription factor called the F-cap-B that there's a pathway that gets the end capital we need to turn on genes that are important in our host defense, in our immune response, and in inflammation in general. Polyphenols, some of them, are potent at shutting that down. So when we got involved with this, we had this dichotomy. The response we were seeing in ourselves wasn't a shutdown. I wouldn't claim it to be an anti-inflammatory response. I certainly wouldn't claim it to be an anti-tumor cell response. And so it seemed a little bit inconsistent with what was in the literature. And so as a scientist, we were curious and we moved forward with it. So that's how we got involved uh, in polyphenols. Now we're involved in polyphenols in a, in a big way. So the polyphenols that we're working with uh, have to be derived from the peels of either apples or grapes. That happens to be a rich source of the polyphenols that we're working on. And to make a long story short, I told you that we have an incredible array of different <laughs> molecules that are classified as polyphenols. They can be single monomers and dimers and trimers. They can be easily hydrolyzed or they can be uh, bound together by carbon carbide bonds that are really tough to break uh, and so forth. The class of polyphenols that we identified in our extracts that we're activating in our gamma delta T cells 
are these ones that are called procyanidins or proanthocyanidins. Um, these happen to be some of the ones that are very resistant to break down, that are held together by carb carbon bonds. And what was interesting to us at the time, and now I think it, it really is a pretty striking finding, is that within this group of polyphenols that we were looking at, and then we started now to compare other polyphenols, our activity actually was restricted to these, these procyanidins. Um, Gary Stoner, who talked about uh, these, uh, uh, now I'm blanking out on the, the names of the, the types of polyphenols that he's working on, as an immunologist, I'm not a chemist, I looked at the structures and I thought, oh, they're going to have robust activity in our assays. Not a lick of activity in our, our assays. We didn't good stimulate our, our particular cell types. So, what I'm saying is that within an extract, you have mixtures of different materials, compounds, and so forth. Some of them are polyphenols. Within the polyphenols, you have tremendous mixture of structures. And within that mixture, you're going to have different biological activities. And so, when we're looking at these things, how do we identify a signature that defines the activity of the extract? We have a ways to go. This is an incredibly complex arena. So, we've continued with this, and we're looking at whether or not our response that we see, we can find any evidence of this in vivo, back in some biologically relevant system. So, I said anti inflammation isn't consistent with our response. So the first thing that a colleague in our group, Jared Skyberg, did was look at some of the inflammation models. And one of the areas that polyphenols have been shown to be very beneficial as an anti-inflammatory agent is in colitis. And these are models in which a chemical will be used to induce colitis. And you use polyphenols, and you can really shut down that, that colitis event. That's not really consistent with what we were seeing. So he reproduced that. Uh, he's now gone in and looked at whether or not, well, are the predictions from the literature correct? Is this just a shutdown of that NM kappa B, you know, shut everything down? And he's actually attributed to his, his effect to a single cell type with the intestinal mucosa. It's not a gamma delta, it happens to be an alpha beta T cell. Um, he really couldn't see a gamma delta response, and that's a little bit disappointing. Um, but he went into an animal and removed the alpha betas, and if you remove the alpha betas, now you see this response by the other cell type. So this alpha beta is mediating somehow this suppressive activity. It's a real cruel avenue of research because now you've got a cellular target in understanding how this may be potentially working. So we have that going on, and we're looking at those particular responses within the intestinal mucosa. But as Alan indicated, we're an infectious disease lab. We want to know, can these be beneficial in any type of infectious disease setting? And so we have put them into various models and putting, feeding an animal and looking at a pulmonary infection, we do have a significant benefit that we see in the lung now. So here we got it fed into the, the gut and we're seeing a peripheral response out of the lung. That's exciting uh, to us, and now being able to track that mechanism of an action. Another person in our group, Jody Hedges, has been looking at antiviral responses uh, with the polyphenols. And she's got probably the coolest data that now allows us to kind of move forward and look at specific mechanism of action. I told you this priming effect, the polyphenols that we're working with tend to make cells respond better to secondary signals. She's got this great data that one of our major antiviral responses, which is a type 1, it's called type 1 interferon, sorry, another cytokine, can be enhanced by the, the polyphenols. And she actually has that now in a semi, I guess you can call it almost a clinical study, in humans, where uh, taking polyphenols, you can measure this response in the blood cells. And so you clearly can get peripheral responses by oral intake with these things. But you gotta know what you're looking for, and I think in the context of the structures themselves, that's gonna be an important component, is really having to understand which ones can even be making it across the epithelium, are biologically available, and will have appropriate activity. 
So we've got a series of experiments where you just simply feed the animal raws uh, in looking at responses. But we're still interested in drug discovery. And as immunologists, I'm still curious of how these things are working. How are they driving these particular responses? And then we're still really interested in, we're looking for efficacy, but we've got to keep our eyes open for any potential toxicity. So we've left the head and we're bypassing the gut. I'm taking these things that we isolate and we're putting them directly in the periphery just to see if we can get certain peripheral responses. And we do. We get responses that you probably don't really see when you take them orally because you probably never take enough of the material orally to see these things in the periphery. But we've got a pretty cool observation in a tumor model. So I'm not a tumor biologist, but when Gary came and gave his talk, he's now on our board of uh, advisory board and so forth. We've got to look at tumor models. We have a graduate student in the lab that has some interesting anti-tumor effects of polyphenols. And that shouldn't surprise anybody in here who's familiar with the polyphenol li literature. Anti-tumor effects have been known for years and years. However, in his model, if he, when he got his anti-tumor effect, if he took away this gamma delta T cell that we've been working on for 20 years, the effect was gone. So it's the first time of having a cell type specific response. Now, is that relevant as a supplement? Can't tell you, because we're injecting it. Uh, is it going to give us clues to potential drug discovery? That's, that's kind of our hope in that particular study. Now, I know I'm probably getting close to uh, probably already taking an hour, uh, just like class, right? Yeah. Just like class. Um, but there's but the other aspect, you know, the title of this talk, good or bad, and so forth. It's very important to have a, a handle on these what are potential deleterious effects. And we have one observation working with uh, Yvonne Voyage in our department, who works on MRSA. So that's the antibiotic resistant staff. Uh, it looks like when she adds our material to the bug, it turns on virulence genes. So we got a lot to do. We've got to be able to understand not only what polyphenols can do to the host, to us, but to, what are they going to do to the bugs? And that's been kind of left out of a lot of the equation and so forth. So take home message on this are the complexity is far greater than I would have ever appreciated just so simply looking at you know the, the labels on, on things and so forth within the, the polyphenols. We have a long ways to go in identifying which ones have certain types of activity. What is the activity we want? And then having appreciation of dosing. We really don't have a handle on that. And then obviously on, on safety. I think safety, that's what's going to drive the FDA and that's certainly driving the, the NIH. The other class compounds, materials that we're working on are polysaccharides. They aren't subtle. Uh, the, the polyphenols are subtle. Uh, the response, if we didn't know what we were looking for, we would have missed it. Polysaccharides, no, it's like hitting ourselves with a hammer. Uh, and you know you get, there, so you get the gamma, the gamma interferon and so forth. But the responses we get, the story are very similar if you're familiar with the beta glucan stories out there. And you know, beta glucans are used in animal feed, chicken feed, and so forth to enhance innate defenses. Uh, they work pretty well in that context. We've got projects looking at that. Um, but I do worry a little bit about those because the response is pretty robust. If you do get systemic responses, uh, the joints may start hurt and so forth because damn interferon is not a great thing to be having systemically. But we do have projects on that and looking at safety, efficacy, and so forth. So the, the question is, well, you're asking about the normal flora. The, what, impact did the normal flora have on the evolution of man? Well, it's a, there's, there's two things I would throw into that. Not simply the normal flora, but diet. In the context of the, the evolution of our immune system. I'm going to focus on the immune system. That's, that's easy for an immunologist. And it's clear that our immune system has evolved with that flora. 
that's evolved with the, the dietary intake. Um, we know that if you take animals and you put them in these germ-free environments, the development of the immune system is completely uh, haywire. It's very immature. Uh, it doesn't develop its regulatory pathways. And those, you know, when we think about immune responses, we're always thinking about turning things on and so forth. Um, but it's really the turning things off that's probably more important. Uh, well, I should say more important. You've got to turn them on to have a benefit, but you've got to get them turned off. Otherwise, we're going to have disease, autoimmune diseases, and arthritis, and so forth. The immune system learns that via that response to the normal flora. So that normal flora is critically important. And I think Alan would even probably agree, probably within the lung, um, that that's true, not to the same extent as the gut. Um, but that's how our immune system evolved. And our immune system is incredibly complex. And we have exquisite mechanisms of control that are absolutely necessary in order to have a proper response. And you've all heard of the hygiene hypothesis, right? And part of that hypothesis is, is <laughs> given to account for why do we have more allergies now? Why do we have more uh, asthma now than we did in the past? Well, that could be due to the fact that our immune systems are not quite as developed as they were in the past because we live now in a more immunologically clean environment. So our normal flora may not be quite the same right now. Certainly our diet and uh, what we're exposed to. And our immune system isn't being conditioned in the same way, and is that the reason why we're not regulating allergy responses as well as in the old days, if that is all true. And the, the, the thing that I give the Lamy students and so forth is that uh, allergy responses are very similar to the responses that we have uh, towards parasites um, and the type of response that we have in the, the gut. And probably in the old days, we dealt with a lot of parasites uh, and our immune system was conditioned on how to regulate that response. That may not be the case now, and that's one of the hypotheses of why we have more asthma and allergies than in the not too distant past, I know I went off on a tangent there, I do this all the time in immunology. Anytime I get a chance to talk about immunology, I go. But I think I, I, I think it played a, a critical role in the development of the sophistication of our immune system and the control. When you think about what our immune system has to do, it's really, really amazing. So I don't know if you guys all appreciate this. But at birth, your immune system can tell the difference between all the proteins, and I, I, I overstate some of this just to make the story a little easier to understand, all the proteins that make up self versus anything we could be exposed to in our lifetime. And our immune system can distinguish those two things. And it does that in most instances, we've got exceptions in most instances, by recognizing proteins, the amino acid sequences that make a protein unique. That might be the confirmation of the amino acid sequence. And that's what the rhinovirus that you're going to breathe in today, you're going to get that cold in a couple of weeks. It's got a protein sequence that's unique, that defines it as a rhinovirus. You've got an immune cell that you already had at birth. And I appreciate this, but at birth, you already had the immune cell made that has on its surface a receptor that's a mirror image of that protein that makes that rhinovirus unique. And you have the capacity, theoretical capacity, to respond to 10 to 15 different foreign signatures and so forth. Now, you never do because 10 to the 15th, uh, in order to respond, you make an antibody against this thing. A cell makes an antibody, so we can't have 10 to the 15 cells. But theoretically, we could. We have that level of sophistication. How do we control that? The immune system has amazing mechanisms to control that have evolved over time to tell the difference between self and non-self. And to be able to react to a protein that's never existed on Earth before. So take a protein from Mars, I can put it into you, you've got an immune cell already made that has a receptor that's a mirror image of that protein. Pretty cool. It's all due to genes. It breaks the one gene, one protein rule. Because uh, if you just believe me, we can make 10 to the 15th 
different receptors, the antibody molecules, and one gene makes one protein. We'd have to believe in that we have 10 to the 15 different genes. We get there in a cool way. And that's the evolution of the immune system. Very impressive. Could okay. I just add a very brief yeah. comment and answer to that question? Yeah. Because I just saw a paper about a month ago that was ast astounding. Uh, they were comparing germ-free rodents to the normal rodents. And they saw a big deficit in the development of the brain in the germ-free rodents. This is stunning. I mean, I just read the paper. I haven't really evaluated it, but at least that's a possible. There is an amazing link between the immune system and the nervous system. Many of the factors will work on both. And, you know, one of the, I know it's, this is a big leap, but I can at least say it in a setting like this. One of the defining features of the immune system is memory. There's a defining feature of the nervous system, right? Medical student. But there are, there's a tremendous linkage between the nervous system and the, the, the immune system. Factors that cross over. GABA receptors. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I 
Linus is taught to miss me uh, at the time, um, but I don't do those uh, anymore. In fact, I think my wife would agree that I don't take any vitamins anymore. She gives me a hard time with that. It really probably should be taking vitamin D, uh, you know, as a, as a supplement. Definitely. The vitamin D, the data is impressive, and we actually have a little data on some unique responses of vitamin K um, that gets me thinking a little bit more to look at vitamin K. Um, what's that? That's bananas. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not, I'm not a, a, a big supplement taker, um, and so I wouldn't, I can't tell you that I take one on a regular basis. Now, have I tried some of the ones that I work on? You bet. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you if I think they work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think behind yeah, you, Sandra. Um, you mentioned the word Yes. I know. But what the heck is it? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a great question. Uh, because you can't make it through the day. Um, and certainly on the packages, on uh, all the juice that you get, the pomegranate juice that you get, the cranberry juice or the, uh, the supplement, you know, it'll be big words antioxidants. And what does that mean? Uh, these things do have potent antioxidant activity, which means they can scavenge uh, oxygen radicals um, and nitrogen radicals and, and so forth. And those, if they accumulate in tissues, can damage DNA, and there's thoughts that it could contribute to transformation of cells, certainly can have impacts on lipids, these oxygen radicals. And so the thinking is, being an antioxidant, that would be beneficial in those settings. However, you know, the antioxidants got to get them um, and so we have big questions of bioavailability and whether or not things really are translocating. A lot of these polyphenols, if you go to the literature, they, well, they're, they're almost anti-nutrition because they just sit in the gut. You know, they're going to bind up proteins. In fact, the beneficial polyphenols in tea, if you, if you drink tea and you like tea and so forth, well, don't put cream in there. Um, it sucks them all out. And then the question is, well, how much really does get across the epithelial barrier. That's one of our big questions. I had a brief discussion in, the, in our break that I didn't even get into. I think the next big leap is to get to those questions of, in, in using antioxidant activity, but I'm going to use my gamma delta T cell activity. It's the same issue. Can we get bioavailable material to the periphery where you would want to have a benefit for antioxidant activity or gamma delta activity? And I think the big, there's two big hurdles um, that we have to overcome. What's in the gut already? Um, would you, you know, so you have a big meal and you take the stuff, you're going to get the same effect if you fasted. But then these dang microbes, the normal flora, what impact are they having? All of that then, because they'll break down a lot of these things. And so what really makes it to the periphery when the people say these are antioxidants? I think that's just the big black box out there right now. But you see it everywhere. Yeah. I actually have two questions. The first is, you know, you say, are they good or bad? All these vitamins, most of them are water soluble except for A, D, E, and K. So aren't Americans just spending a lot of money for very expensive urine? Is it just, you know, our body uses what it needs from our food and then the rest goes out. So that's one question. In fact, you probably read this, this letter from Harvard, uh, and that, that's exactly what's said in this uh, Harvard Health publication that, yeah, you know, the, the bulk of them come in via just normal diet at sufficient levels. And then T. Colin Campbell wrote a book called The China Study. And in that book, he made, some, he made a claim I had never heard before that some children, um, when they're exposed to milk at a young age, depending on their genes, that protein from cow's milk will stimulate an immune response that causes it to destroy the pancreas and causes type 1 diabetes. I have never heard that anywhere else. Do you know anything about that? Well, I would agree with your statement. I've never heard that. Uh, uh, you know, certainly I've heard, I mean, there's many, many uh, studies looking at the impact of uh, mother's milk and so forth on the about proteins 
you know, immune cell reactivity and, and uh, you know, most of the work is just looking at the, the tr passive transfer of immunity from the mother, and that's just the history of antibodies that she has. But within the milk are also factors, you know, these cytokines and so forth, and they do have an impact. Uh, but I, 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 I think I can't figure out how taking a cow's milk would predispose to reacting to the island cells and the pancreas to lead to type 1 uh, diabetes. That is a defined autoimmune disease. <coughs> breakdown of our ability to tell the difference between self and non-self. And in type 1 diabetes, there's a breakdown not only in the T cells, but on the B cells as well. And so they're reacting to self peptides. It's the peptides that make up the key proteins within the, the island. That ain't cow. Um, so I'm not really sure how, other than, you know, if there's some type of dysregulation that it occurred in the development of the immune system. I, yeah, I, I just don't see it, but yeah, I've never heard that before. Maybe Ellen can come up with a better hand leading answer than me. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk about enzymes in your cells and in the Is that only a tool Yeah, that's that's a great point. The uh, if the benefit of some of these polyphenols of the antioxidant activity and they're scavenging up the free radicals that people think are damaged DNA, uh, then it would be something that you'd be taking before the transformation event, right? However, I believe in Gary Stoner's work, a presentation that he did, I don't want to speak for him, but kind of to give a synopsis of his talk, he went into patients esophageal cancer patients, and I think colon cancer patients. And he puts them on, this is the other aspect uh, that I kind of glossed over, but if you ever read any of the literature, anybody, any of the non-believers in polyphenols, one of the uh, criticisms that they throw out is that you got to use a lot of material to get a lot of the biological responses. And in Gary's clinical studies, he's giving his people a, a, an extract, I think about 60 grams, um, was the material, which is a lot. And this is from berries, these polyphenols. But his clinical studies, the patient number isn't huge, but he does have uh, biological effects in that, that setting. So in that setting, the tumor's already there. And so it's a direct effect that some of these polyphenols can affect the tumor cell itself. And then if the polyphenols are enhancing maybe some aspect of the immune system. Um, but everything that he's still looking at is to the throat, to the, uh, the colon. Um, you know, I think that the big leap is can you have, affect anything out in the periphery? And how could you get the material there? That's one of our things we're really interested in. I want to avoid the gut because obviously, even if I, I can learn what impact the gut has, the, the normal flora, and the food intake has on polyphenols. Not going to be changing a whole lot. I want to get these polyphenols directly to the periphery, so we're looking at doing that under the tongue. Um, great place to, to work, and then avoid all of that. And then be able to then look at anti tumor responses in that setting. Yeah. Dr. Jill, can you talk a little bit more about that topic? About most of us are taking nutraceuticals or vitamins orally, yeah. but your research is saying that that may not be the best way to take it. Well, in a lifetime, are we going to see transdermal or nasal? Or? Okay, be, uh, be careful. We're, when we're going to the periphery, it's one, because I'm lazy, because um, I, I can't wait uh, for it to get to the gut, and I want to see what happens when I put the material on you who does X on the bench top, what does it do in the periphery? So I put it there. But there's also, an, I still have my goal of making a drug. Um, and these things are really cool, what they do to cells. And if I can induce responses by injecting it, then can I go to people like Ed and, and have a synthetic made and have a, a druggable material? Because polyphenols are not druggable. Uh, at least that's what the pharmaceutical industry tells you over and over and over again. So that's one of the, the, the reasons. But back to your point, I think, and we're, we're doing this, uh, uh, one of the responses in our gamma delta T cells this GMCSF, it's a classic response that's involved in wound repair. 
And there are other factors that gamma delta T cells make that are growth factors for epithelial cells, keratinocytes in the skin. And uh, I think uh, going to the skin would be a great route um, to, to deliver, or a patch in the, in the uh, underneath the tongue. Um, just get rid of the gut. Uh, and it's complexity. Yes. Yeah. A lot of us are living longer and we're collecting Social Security and pensions and Medicare, and we're not contributing very much. Are there any clinical trials that we could participate there, in? There, safe, there. Safely? Yeah, you know, it's actually, I think, I think Gary did, uh, he worked with uh, one of our local oncologists. Uh, uh, no, another Okay. Yeah, yeah, and you can see like uh, on some of his uh, his clinical works, you know, he's doing real small scale uh, stuff. But the NCAM part of the NIH, that's that thing I introduced at the beginning. Uh, they're they're fostering or sponsoring, co-sponsoring uh, clinical studies on uh, some of these polyphenols, you know, the green tea, is it green tea? Yeah. CG or whatever. But not uh, here in Bozeman. But not in Bozeman. Bozeman, you still need a, uh, a medical school for most of uh, these clinical studies uh, in order to tap into a, uh, a patient base and so forth. Doesn't mean it can't be done in Montana. Uh, certainly, Missoula has, has moved into some clinical studies and so forth. But that, why it couldn't be done here? There are some things I could. Clinicaltrial.gov. And you'll see it.